Hello and welcome to Buildings of Tomorrow. My name is John Lester and in today's episode we're going to talk about how analytics and IoT can really change the way that we operate buildings. I'm joined today by Brad Haberling. He's the Head of Service for Siemens Smart Infrastructure. Brad, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, John. Appreciate having me today. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Me as well. I'm excited because, uh, you know, we, I mentioned in the, the title there a couple of different technologies, analytics, IoT, but like always, technology is fun, but it's what we do with it, which is more fun. So that's what I'm excited about talking with you uh, today. And of course, it doesn't matter what the technology is that we're using, we're looking to try and solve some challenges because I'm interested to understand how we can address those challenges when we start talking about the technology and, and the, the services or the digital services to go with that. So how would you go about it? When we talk about technology specifically, and again, when we, when we started the episode, we talked about IoT uh, and analytics. How does, uh, let's start with IoT. How do, do technologies like IoT and wireless connectivity help us start to address some of these challenges? Yeah, um, first, you know, IoT is a big word, kind of a buzzword out there. You see out there, uh, but it's it's really enabling technology that allows us to do things that we always wanted to do. It just we couldn't do it cost effective first and foremost. So it's technology that enables something else. And you look at buildings. The example I'll, I'll give you a couple examples. Number one, um, we would always operate a building more on a set of schedules. So we would turn things off, turn things off. It was based on some assumptions on how the building operate. But we really didn't know what was happening in that building at any given day. So the first thing is you look at IoT, the sensor network consents and has a very good idea on who's there, when they're there. And it doesn't mean an individual for, for, for security reasons, but it knows a person's there, how many people, what they're entering, what the patterns are. So it starts to learn from that. Uh, and what that gives you the capability, on example, just on lighting purely, before it would be on a schedule, six o'clock in the morning, turn off, then it would turn it on at six o'clock in the morning. You might dim things on the weekend. Sometimes you'd leave it on all night and be able to do that. Now it senses, it knows when you're coming in. It will only turn on the specific areas you're turning on. Um, and then it will also learn over time how the patterns of that and start adjusting, even the dimming and that stuff. So that saves energy and makes it more efficiency. Same thing occurs when you use that sensor neck to control the heating and ventilation. Same thing, it makes decisions and more efficient decisions. So you, you save energy, which is save sustainability and your CO2 reduction. Uh, it's better operations because they're not using these sources. So you don't have to change bulbs. You don't have to change uh, equipment as much more because the run time's down there. So it has a lots of effect on there. Uh, but the key on there is IoT, for just the sake of IoT, doesn't mean anything. It's what you use it and how you turn it into services and what you do to apply that is really what's most important. And then let's take to that next step, because as yeah. you mentioned before, which is a great line, I like that IoT for IoT's sake is useless. You have to, to know what you want to do with it. You have to use it for a purpose. So how does that, then, then we t when we take that step to, to services, digital services, and within that analytics, how does that enable us to really start addressing those challenges? Yeah, so lots of examples there. And, and let me just state this is, here's the challenge on that. So what happens is every manufacturer or every piece of equipment wants to build their own IoT type of piece on there. But if you run a facility, it's a complex ecosystem of different systems working. That's information that's helpful. You need information that it directs you in the right area. So let me let me just share how, how it kind of operates. I told you before, in the past, we operated on kind of schedules and preventative maintenance. Uh, so the difference today is what you're looking at is we, we pull information out of buildings, okay? It's constantly flowing of both technical information, but then also combining that with what's happened with your maintenance management and your routines. So you look at that two data streams that are coming out, you're correlating that and you're running analytics on there. And what it will do is it will tell you where problems will happen before it has it. And, and I'll just give you a simple example of that, which I think is a great example. We had a big university customer, uh, multi-campuses, high-end university, wanted to have good services. Um, and what they were looking at is they were really in a reactive service mode. So um, they would do approximately 80,000 different hot and cold calls a year, okay? So we'd have all this massive hot and cold call pieces and it would be taking a reactive because all his team was doing is going out and finding out that problem. What we did is really simple. Let me give you an example that we pushed the data up. What we did is we ran analytics on there and we could see the root cause of that problem. So it was a piece of equipment. When you went down a stream, you would think it was uh, on air handling, but you went down, 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 and you might find it was a uh, stuck valve. 
or something like this. Uh, and what we did then, if you connect that to the maintenance management data, you could see the correlation of how many tickets were done. Now, each one of those tickets are people doing something that are cost. Yep. And then you look at what that correlator, and you can fix the root cost. So instead of 18 different issues that were occurred, basically there was 18 hot and cold calls they sent it out, you could see the problem, where it occurred, and you solve the problem. We, we, we plugged that information and analytics on this university. Within two months, we cut down half of their hot and cold calls, half of their reactive services. But when you go further and further, you can drop that. Then you can use that cost to do more improvement things. Yeah, right. And just for, for clarification, when you talk about hot and cold calls, this is urgent calls or calls to a service provider to come out and check something, fix something, do something like that. Yeah, yeah. These were actually calls from their tenants, right. which are a combination of professors, students. Right. And this one is great because it's a very rich school. And if, if anyone knows the U.S. schools, they're about, this one's probably $60,000 per year they're paying for the student. So the actual parents would call in for their kids for their kids right. were uncomfortable. But that's the level of service. So you're, that's the people that are funding you. So you got to take care of them. And, and that's the, you, you talked about that balance between you know, efficiency, energy cost versus expectation and service. That's a level of service. Yes. And if you have 80,000 calls and you reduce this by half, it's a huge amount of time and, that's, and cost. That's two months. That's not... <sighs> When you go further, that's what you do is you change the dialogue on you're doing, instead of doing reactive services, you stop doing that and you're doing, first you're doing preventative services and then you're doing predictive services. And even your preventative services change drastically mm -hmm. because before you'd literally have someone go out with a clipboard or looking at running kind of analysis on tools, mm -hmm. you can do all that activity instead of once a month or once a quarter, you're doing that, constantly doing that same routine. And you're seeing when things are out, outside of scope and you know then you're going to have a problem. And then over time, you run an algorithm that will predict those problems. And then you can direct your activities. It changes, completely changes how you operate. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what's happening today. And really, it's just starting. Uh, and so the future is really bright for that. What are the next steps for an industry? You know, we started with just basically remote reaction. So customers call in. We used to just roll, roll a technical expert on there. So now we have a team that can do a diagnostic and solve that problem 60, 70% of the time. So that's the first phase. Then what we looked at the service we provide on there and how could we do much more of the preventative activities through looking at systems and machines. So when we send a tech on a job, they direct it to the problems versus that. Then we went to more of, I call the predictive pieces with the analytics on there uh, and how we go do that. But then what we've really seen the trend really change in the last two years is how does the customer's interface the building and how can you use that? And that's when you're looking at how someone's in there, a group of persons are working in a building. And before they would have picked up the phone and call, now they can use their app, they interface the building and say hot and cold. We might not do anything. We might wait until there's crowdsourcing until five or six people are doing it and you make decisions at the same time you're running the analytics. They also can order their food, they can, they can tell where their card serves. So they're interacting with the building. So you're seeing a much more interaction and that's kind of the next phase of what that is. Um, so that, that's, that's a, a kind of the future phase. But then when you get into other parts of the space, there's also things that you can do that are pretty complex that are interesting, like security, for example. Traditionally, it was a guard watching that and watching it happen. Now you have analytics and see, wake them up and say, here's what's happening on that. And I, I was just in a great example of that um, it, with a really complex customer who was um, in, in the Middle East who was, was doing a big event, massive event for six months on there. And they were using some very sophisticated way it's where they could see incidents happening. And traditionally, you would send a guard. Well, they could immediately provide that information through video mediums mm -hmm. to the local police, right. tell them exactly through geofencing where that is. Not only that, they could, they could immediately dispatch a drone to be able to see what was happening at the same time. So a lot of really cool technology you can do uh, by using all those use cases and taking information and tying it together. We have an industry that's complex, no matter whether you're talking about fire safety, security, energy, uh, building management, whatever it might be. There are many different pieces uh, that, that uh, you know, mechanical systems, electrical systems. And we have a, a, an industry of experts that are aging. And sometimes that knowledge isn't held in the, in the next generation of, of experts and professionals in our industry. How, how does this digital service, this analytics help us bridge this gap? How can we support those in our industry in the future who might not have the same level of, of hands-on experience and knowledge, how can we support them and enable them to still be as effective and, and, and efficient? 
Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great question, and it's a challenging question. But I always look in the HVAC world. Yeah, um, exactly. if you If you talk about it, it, I always find it, you talk to owners, and what they'll tell you is this, this mechanic will come out. Yeah. And they say this is magic. He kind of puts his hand on this thing, and he knows he can feel vibrations, and he kind of he knows what's going to happen. He can pinpoint the problem. That's a knowledge, probably forty years of experience of seeing what's happening. Probably can predict what what that happened. Yeah. You can't duplicate that because it takes years and years of experience. But what what you can do is when you don't have that capabilities, you're looking at through analytics and, and sensors. You'll be able to kind of duplicate that same. You're taking that brain and what the what he's processing, and you're doing it into a system. And over time, you'll start to see detections of what will happen, and it will direct that. You still need that expert to go fix that problem because there's still a physical problem that happens. So that's never going to go away. We need the people. We need that expertise. That doesn't go away. It just supplements what they're doing. So it gives them the insights to go do that if you don't have that kind of knowledge base. Uh, and those people are less and less people. So that's where I see it. it's a supplement, but there's still people that are going to have to do things. These are a piece of equipment that change and modify, and they're still the critical critical part of this chain yeah. it just you supplement them in a much better way than you did what what's the next step you now we, we talk from a technology perspective um, but you talked a little bit about how services can really deliver you know, on customer expectations you know based around what they're looking to achieve rather than uh, an individual function what's the how can services help customers achieve what they're looking to achieve less from a technical perspective more from you know their outcomes their goals yeah um this is a really important topic for us um, because customers have very clear objectives what they're doing. If you look at it, they, they have clear metrics that they're running their facilities, and those metrics are tied to what's the mission of that business. Okay, and it differs between if you're a pharmaceutical R&D facility, you might want to uptime and conditions of that R&D because you have a, a mice lab that is, needs to be, that's a 10-year-old experiment, and you need to make sure that it's under the exact same condition. You miss those conditions, it all goes away. To a data center uptime, they need to do. Or hospital patient satisfaction. So they all have their mission. It's a matter of how does the facility support those mission. So for us, what it is, is identify those key KPIs that are the drivers to their mission and see how those affect. And then you set benchmark and you drive to improve the performance on that. And how the services can do one is we can use the information to know exactly where we are at any given time with dashboarding and tools to see how we're on those those benchmarks. And then what we do is we divide a combination of physical services with on-site, off-site services with analytics to be able to continue to make improvements in those things. And that's the key. Not only that, and make sure that they don't go the other way. Uh, so have those improvements and not go the other way. And you can do that in a much more efficient way today than you ever did because you have the information to go do that. Before it was a physical activity. It wasn't that they didn't have the same ideas. It's just the cost to do that and the labor to make those things happen. So that's why the strategy was we're going to do preventative maintenance and hope it doesn't break. Yeah. That's really, and preventative maintenance was the good side. Mainly people did reactive. So you have ability to get ahead of that and see what that information, and then you target your maintenance, and that's really the key. So it's a totally different approach, yeah. uh, and everyone's trying to tackle that. People are at different levels of maturity, um, and we've w the good part is we've learned because we see all kinds of different buildings all over the world, and you learn from that, and we have the data to be able to learn from that very quickly and rapidly and then help other customers. Yeah, and, and, and that's where, you know, if we link back to the, the, the very start. That's why technologies like IoT, technologies like analytics and, and digital services are such a key enabler for that. Because without that, as you say, we wouldn't be able to scale. We wouldn't have the, the ability to, to deploy these kinds of services. As an industry, we just wouldn't have enough people. We wouldn't have yeah. the resources. Brad, thanks so much. Great conversation. Thanks so much for joining us. It was a good fun. Thanks, John. I really appreciate it. And for our audience out there, um, go through this journey. It's well worth it. It it's, uh, changes the way you operate. It's the future. Uh, and we hope we can help you get there. Thanks again, Brad. And thanks to everyone that is uh, with us today. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Please remember to like, comment, or share this episode. Also ensure that you subscribe, check out our, diff our new episodes as they come out every other week. And hey, um, feel free to share it with your colleagues. And until we see you, we'll see you soon.